Well, thanks very much, Jeff, and I want to thank the Office of the VP of Research and Grant Studies for services for bringing us all together. I think it's just fabulous to be able to put on an event and all you have to do is show up and, and here we are. So they did all the work and all the food and uh, space arranging and promoting of this. So all we have to do now is come up with lots of great ideas and two of us already have some, so we're ahead of the game. Sarah and I are already thinking about how we're going to talk to international faculty together. Um, so what I wanted to do a little bit is just acquaint you with the work-life office first and uh, and then we'll get into our presenters. So maybe what I can, can I put this on here and not burn it up? Good. Okay, so this is our, our new website and I'm going to see if I can do this with my left hand. Um, so we do live in Linton Hall. This is not just a nice picture that everybody else on campus also uses. Um, it's our home, so you should come and visit us on the first floor in the old section there. And uh, we spend a lot of time developing our vision and mission and our values statement to be sure that we are clear about where we're going, what we're doing, and how we relate to the rest of the university. And then you'll find, if you go down the website, a lot of the things where our energy goes into our publications and our services, our news, and our pushing out of information and events for folks, down to our upcoming events um, area, where it's at things like this event, to get some prof profile. But what we're talking about today, well, I'm going to just run through these top items here. We have sort of five focus areas, and one of the things I wanted to make clear at the beginning of this was why we brought together people from all kinds of places, as you could all hear you are, and the variety in our panel, and what's the common theme and how does that connect to work life. So we have our five areas of focus, which um, include the family care piece, career transitions, um, and we've got folks addressing that on our panel. Workplace assistance is really about all the things that already exist at MSU, so benefits through HR, programming through AAN, all the kinds of things, EAP, where we can already connect you to existing resources. And then we're really focusing a lot on relocation and community connecting. As we bring in more and more folks from wider and wider geographic areas, we want to ensure that they land here as comfortably and smoothly as possible so that they can be as productive and satisfied as soon as possible. So we've got sort of a number of areas there, and today's initiative really focuses on our research branch, where we're both engaged in doing research, we're reaching out to you folks to join with us and with one another to promote research in the area that connects all of these dots that relate to our work and our personal lives. And then also um, we're working on pushing out research that you may want to know about. So Lydia is working on an annotated bibliography of emerging research and making it easy to connect to the current research in our field. So that kind of situates us as to where we are. And speaking of Lydia, I want to take a minute to just highlight the work life staff, although they just introduced themselves. Lydia Weiss is our education program coordinator and graphics persons par excellence. Um, Audrey Smith is our office manager, as she said and keeps us on toes, on our toes, and accountable. And Lori is our Lifespan and Family Services Coordinator, so she's keeping all of those folks aligned. And I don't know, we really didn't coordinate the red and black thing, but uh, <laughs> I, I, think, I think we all wanted to be like, yay, work life today. <laughs> so at this point, um, I just want to take a minute to introduce each of the panelists. And, and the reason that I chose to do it this way uh, is so that you can all get to know who they are but also to highlight their connection to the work-life office. So our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Roger Baldwin, who is the Mildred B. Erickson Distinguished Chair, he didn't mention that, in Adult and Lifelong Education in the College of Education. Roger is also helping us host a symposium on alternative paths to retirement next month, so stay tuned for that. Um, so his work focuses on changing faculty appointment patterns, faculty in the later stages of academic life, and evolving those roles and professional activities. So for me, looking at that, the connection with work life was all about the career transitions part, right, where we talked about that a minute ago, and the research piece, and it will certainly, Roger's work will have impact on the workplace assistance piece as we look at benefits and how we structure retirement for later stage academics. So I'd like to, at this point, give it over to Roger. Okay. Um, it's nice to find people elsewhere at the university who have 
complementary interests uh, to what uh, I, I'm interested in. So I look forward to having conversations with many of you today. Uh, I, I wanted to start out uh, by putting my current interests into a broader context. So that's the purpose of this first slide. Uh, as, I, as I've been reflecting, as now that I'm a senior faculty member, I've been reflecting back on, uh, it's often later in life when uh, you make sense of, of what you've done with your life. Uh, at least you try to do that. So I, I, I think what I've tried to do is understand the arc of academic life, uh, how, uh, how the challenges and opportunities of academic life uh, evolve over time, and then more specifically, um, what kinds of support structures and resources are needed to help people uh, be maximally uh, productive uh, and fulfilled uh, throughout, throughout their professional life. So uh, trying to impose some order on what I've spent the last 30 years doing, that, that's the best I, I can do right at the moment. So that takes, takes us to where I am right now. Um, my, my current focus, uh, perhaps for obvious reasons, is on later academic life. Um, in higher education, in, in my field, there's been quite a bit of research on academic careers in recent years, but most of the emphasis has been, been on early academic life, preparation for academic life, some attention to mid-career, almost no attention to people later in academic life. And yet I would, I would argue that um, that's an important stage of the academic career and we need to have a deeper uh, understanding of, of those, the experiences that period in life and what we need to do as institutions and work-life offices and things of that sort to support people uh, in those kind of capstone years of academic life. So um, I'm interested in learning more about the challenges and opportunities of these stages and again the structures, policies, resources that are needed to support people. Uh, and I'm sure that there are people here who have all kinds of insights that will be new to me, so I'm looking forward to learning more from each of you. Um, ultimately, uh, I've gotten involved in some conversations that are going on nationally about reimagining retirement, especially academic retirement. Um, and Barbara actually helped me with this metaphor, but um, in our society, we, we tend to have a light switch um, understanding of, of retirement. Uh, you get to a fork in the road, you either continue working or you retire. Or you stop working, that's the light switch part, on, off. Um, but Barbara actually came up with the idea of the dimmer switch in one of our meetings a few weeks back. Um, uh, that actually, the chair of religious studies came up with a light switch for me when I was explaining what I do, was doing, and, and so I mentioned this in a meeting where Barbara was, and she said, yeah, that would be more of a dimmer switch where you can kind of cut back a little bit and then maybe, for some good reasons, increase your involvement again and then go back and forth. So um, the, the point is, I, I, I think uh, there's a lot of... Uh, conversation throughout the society, not just in academia, that we re need to rethink later, later life and, and how we engage people, how, how we keep people productively in, involved, and how we take full advantage of the resources that older and retired, retired people have. So that's kind of where I am right now. Um, and, and the other piece of evidence that I want to use is um, I, I've been doing some work on retirement organizations in higher education. There are now well over 200. Uh, throughout the country, and I think that is additional evidence that um, there is some kind of a movement of a foot where, where people want to say they want to maintain relationships with institutions, they still want to remain productively engaged, and they're trying to create structures in order to do that. Um, so, with that, um, there's uh, my, my contact information. I, I know that there are perspectives from, from gerontology, sociology, uh, social work, lots of different uh, areas that, that would be fresh and new to me. So I'm, I'm looking forward to having conversations uh, with you today. So thanks very much. Thanks very much, Roger. And you did an awesome job of keeping to the time limit. Look at that. Um, I just want to mention, while I have a microphone in my hand and a captive audience, that Roger's comment about looking at the structures of work and what we need in place 
Um, in October, our office will be doing our annual conference, which is on the changing nature of work and how we work, what kinds of work we do, um, and what that means for work life. So I'm putting in a plug for our October conference. Mark your calendars now. What's the date, Audrey? October 11th. Okay. Um, so now I'd like to introduce or reintroduce Claire Luz. Um, Claire is an assistant professor in geriatrics and gerontology program in the family medicine department. And her work looks at the importance of understanding multiple aspects of aging, the impact of aging for both caregivers and those of us who are becoming those caregivers and those of us who are doing the aging in the workforce and still staying in the workforce. So following a bit on Roger's themes, um, Claire looks at how we age in the academy and what keeps ourselves uh, engaged. So of course, linking that back to the work life, we're looking at the family care focus again, supports an effective caregiver and, and age-friendly resources within our community and in our larger communities, so outside of MSU as well. And so that will again impact workplace assistance and what we can offer folks when we recognize and embrace the changes that aging bring to us. So, Claire? Um, yes, I'm Claire Laws, Family Medicine. I'm a gerontologist. I've been in the field of aging for 40 years now, 20 years as a clinical social worker in long-term care settings, mostly nursing homes, home care agencies, and now 20 years in academia as a researcher. So thank you, Barbara, for inviting me to be part of this. My, uh, my research is primarily on workforce issues, particularly the direct care workforce, the people who go in and have the, the hands-on care, you know, up close and personal, doing the bathing, showering, dressing, that kind of thing. So I don't conduct work-life research per se, but I do, uh, the work that I do informs very serious work-life issues that arise as a result of aging, right? These are issues that most people prefer not to think about until they have to. Um, we don't think about it as, an, as a nation, and most of us don't want to think about it individually. until And then, because of that, when the situations face us, we're ill-prepared <coughs> to deal with them. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. So it's really time to look at aging from multiple perspectives and the special benefits and challenges that it brings about in this form is perfect because gerontology is a multidisciplinary field to begin with and with the solutions to the challenges that aging brings up really require creativity and crossing disciplinary lines. So the big picture, I'm not going to talk about my research till the last slide and I hope I'm as good as Roger about keeping to time but I can't promise. Um, <laughs> so, I know, I know, I'm going to back up a little bit. So, um, <laughs> all right, so I'm talking about the bigger context. The bigger context is an aging population, and um, so our population, if you don't know this already, most people do, but our population is aging. It's aging rapidly. We have known this for decades, but um, for the most part, we've had our head in the sand, nationally and individually. Um, and we're just now, just now beginning to pull our heads out and take a look around and say, oh my goodness, we have a, we have a situation here. Um, this is a problem and hopefully we have time to address these challenges um, for a number of reasons, not the least of which are the baby boomers coming along, and I'm looking at the, the, age, the demographics in this room here, um, we anticipate that by 2030, nearly a quarter of the population will be age 65 plus. And within that larger group, the fastest growing age group are what we refer to as the oldest old, 85 plus, who require the majority of care. So these are statistics that are going to affect all of us, one, all of us in extraordinarily personal 
ways, but also at the national level. As our parents grow older, as our partners, as we ourselves grow older, who's going to take care of our elders? Who's going to take care of Who's going to take care of me? You know, <laughs> I, I want to know. Okay. So, because the population is aging, we have a uh, a confluence here of some very historical events taking place. People are living longer, and with a higher prevalence of multiple long-term chronic conditions. And because of this, they need a, they need more supportive services, and this costs more money nationally and individually. Um, and so families are trying to take care of their elders and families still provide the bulk of home care. We need more home care now because most people want to live at home. Most of you, I'm assuming, want to stay at home for as long as you can, as independently as possible. So families still provide the bulk of care, but a lot of these families are working people. And it's hard for them, and they need help. So um, I don't know. I know some of the people in this room are in this situation right now, as am I. And um, and if you aren't, I'm imagining that you probably will be, or you're anticipating that you will be within the next few years. So are you prepared? When family members need more help, they turn to paid help. And because of the population aging and the head in the sand mentality and the fact that we place very low value on older people, um, we have a provider shortage. We have a, a real critical shortage of healthcare workers, from geriatricians all the way to the direct care workers that I study. So the workforce is aging. That, by the way, includes us. What is the impact of all of this on us? So. Take a look at these stats for a minute. I'm just going to pass over this slide, but a lot of the people that are taking care of elders are also, they're in this age bracket where they are also taking care of younger family members, right? They have kids still at home or grandkids. A lot of people taking care of grandkids. This is referred to as the sandwich generation. Um, about half of the workforce expects to care for an aging relative in the next five years. Okay, here we go. So the impact of this, this is going to affect MSU. We have about 11,000 faculty and staff members, and nearly a quarter of them are retirement age right now. So we're going to feel it here at MSU. So AAMP did a study of retirees. 19% left work earlier than planned because of elder care. 68% of caregivers have made work transitions or career changes because of elder care. You know, this is things like arriving late, leaving early, cutting back on hours, job sharing, quitting work altogether, um, declining promotions. It has a serious impact on work, on your work, on work life. And still, the majority of caregivers are women, so they are overrepresented here. It causes, can cause financial hardships. The people that leave work early or quit work end up not having as much as social security benefits for their own old age. And of course the physical, emotional, and relationship tools and the business losses with, lo with lower productivity and so forth. So um, how many of you are, have already done some of these things? Well, you know, any, any of these shifts or um, dealing with some of these issues that... This slide is, is actually pretty depressing. I'm sorry about that. I know <laughs> you should go get a glass of wine as soon as, as, soon as I'm done, okay? Um, <laughs> I don't mean to be a, a doomsday play person here. Um, so I will just take one second and, and stress that there are, of course, rewards to aging and rewards and benefits to providing care. Um, we do it, you know, we do it because we love it. We love the people we're caring for. But there are challenges, serious challenges, and we have to address them. And we have to do it soon. Um, and just acknowledge that the challenges exist and get creative and cross-disciplinary lines and figure out how, how to deal with all of these things 
if there's going to be support for people like you who are trying to work and take care of others at the same time. So my last slide, um, solutions and resources, elder care benefits, workplace policies. Thankfully, we do have a, a really robust work-life office here at MSU. <laughs> and I happen to be in the work-life office and noticed a whole bunch of great resources, like a list of elder care resources. So, um, yay, Lori. Um, so we ha we do have things here. We need to, in, in my view, create an age-friendly university. Now there are criteria for this. You can get designated as an age-friendly university. There are two in the United States. Um, we want we want three. It's a great time to do it because East Lansing is now going is going after age-friendly city designation. So it's a perfect time for us to do this kind of thing. So the workforce development, the work-life research that you do, the workforce development research that I do, um, the direct care workers that I work with are, you know, the direct care workers provide up to 80% of paid in-home care. 80%. And you know what? We don't treat them very well. We don't value them. They pay, you know what the average, for doing the tough work that they do, the average wage is about 10 bucks an hour with no benefits. Um, so, if we want good home care, if you want good home care for yourself, for your loved ones, we need a qualified workforce, and we need a workforce that's going, that's happy, right? That they, they want to stay in the job, so that we can cut down on the turnover that's churning this, in this workforce. Um, so, there's just no other way to meet the demand without a good, stable, qualified workforce. So, right now, employers cannot find these workers, they're, they're really dying out there and um, because there aren't enough of them. I did a focus group in Detroit last Saturday with seven direct care workers who go into people's homes in downtown Detroit. Some of them have been doing it for 30 years. Some of them make seven bucks an hour. And they will, they're very articulate, and they will tell you exactly what their challenges are and what needs to be done to fix it and why it's so important to fix it. And they will say, you know, social justice aside, ethics aside, it's just plain foolish to ignore the business case for supporting this workforce. So, um, I did, I will close by saying I did just get a, a nice grant from Michigan Health Endowment Fund to basically, um, well, this is how I describe it, uh, to begin to develop an, um, an infrastructure in Michigan for developing and supporting this workforce. And I'm excited about it. We have five aims. The first aim is really to build a coalition from the ground up with people from all different voices, with all different voices, bring them to the table and charge them with getting to know one another and actually talking to each other and then coming up with some win-win solutions that we can pilot test. So that's our, our number one goal. We have others, and I'm going to stop there, but I will tell you I do have handouts that explain the project over there, and it has my contact information on it. So, um, and I'm happy to talk about it with anybody at any time, and I would love to collaborate with some of you. I have ideas for com arts, I saw food science here, so, you know, there's all kinds of things we could do, do together. So thanks for the opportunity. Okay, hey, thanks Claire, and I just wanted to follow up on one thing you said about work-life research per se. I think a lot of people in the room might feel that they're not work-life researchers per se, but that was the very reason that we brought everybody together, was to find those links, because we might not think of ourselves as work-life researchers per se, and yet maybe we are, and maybe those collaborations will help us identify with that area. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Leslie Gonzalez, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Administration at the College of Education, in case you forgot her three words. And, uh, <laughs> and Leslie's work, not that I remember her three words either, but um, the Leslie's work focuses on the possibility of agency 
among academics to negotiate or remake or resist marginalizing structural and cultural features of academia. And that really caught my eye when I was looking for folks that we want to work with because my work focuses on the construction of the academic world and how we socially construct education at this level and how we construct it to be more or less inclusive of different kinds of folks. And so the idea that Leslie was already looking at how people can have a role in that construction really said to me, well, this is somebody we need to, to bring into this forum. Um, so that, that's where I see the connection to work life being and how we create structures and cultures that either marginalize people or don't marginalize people. And what roles can we all have in recreating that to be more inclusive of all types of folks? So, Leslie. Thank you so much, Barbara. So I have just um, a few slides. Oh, I get a kickback here. Um, so as Barbara said, my, my research is really focused on questions around inclusion and um, what I like to call in my work legitimacy, or achieving a sense of value or fit within one's department. So when I got the invite, I also asked myself, hmm, how does this sort of go lead back into work-life kind of questions? And then I realized it absolutely does because there's always these um, interesting tensions between faculty members, the ways in which they want to do their work, and the evaluative structures um, in which that they have to respond to, and how they sort of balance those things out. So throughout my scholarship, um, if I had to describe it really briefly, um, you would see questions related to legitimacy and agency. And what that means is I'm very interested in asking questions around how faculty members um, strive to create a position for themselves as being legitimate, position their work as legitimate, um, within the context of their departments, their disciplines, or oftentimes their universities, with particular attention to how that looks different across different institutional types. Um, and so what that means often is that I'm very interested in understanding how faculty members who may do non-conventional scholarship or a scholarship that sort of falls outside of the disciplinary boundaries, um, how that gets rewarded, recognized, so on and so forth. Um, that also means I'm pretty much frequently interested in understanding how non-dominant groups of faculty members, um, Latinx faculty, uh, women faculty, how they are sort of working through these systems to try to position themselves and their work as legitimate, valuable, as belonging, so to speak. Um, my work, I hope, um, is intended to inform faculty hiring, um, faculty evaluation processes, and that can happen at multiple levels. So of course the faculty hiring process is most germane to the department. But faculty evaluation, really there's many levels. We can think about the departmental context, we can think about institutional cultures, we can think about the influence of rankings um, and how that can come into how faculty become, come to be evaluated. Um, I think that my work also um, can inform and can be helpful to how we think about mentoring and socializing future faculty, how we think about um, working with future faculty, about working with their future students, and the ways in which they can talk about and build bridges between their own scholarship and the discipline, particularly if they're engaged in non-conventional or interdisciplinary kinds of work. So I wanted to take just a few minutes to highlight um, a few projects in which I'm working on these kinds of questions. Um, one of the projects that I'm currently working on is focused on the intellectual trajectories of women, particularly with focus on women of color. I'm very interested in understanding how women of color across multiple disciplines are, as I like to call it, um, marking their disciplinary literatures. I'm trying to understand the sort of the fundamental philosophical, epistemological knowledge systems with which women are engaging and making marks on their disciplines. Um, this is a project that I've been sort of working on for about, uh, about a year and a half or so. I have another project where um, I'm looking at the emotional labor that is coming to be expected of and assigned to particular groups of faculty members. I'm particularly interested in understanding how emotional labor gets assigned or normalized to faculty of color, particularly working in teaching um, heavy institutions. And then the third and final project that I'm working on right now uh, really gets to that sort of organizational 
level um, way of thinking about diversity and inclusion for faculty, faculty preparation, and faculty socialization. Um, in this project, I'm working with a team of researchers, and we're trying to understand how not only colleges and universities as organizations, but multiple kinds of organizational stakeholders come together and create understandings around what are the roles and responsibilities for faculty when it comes to inclusion or diversity work, when it comes to diversifying STEM, the STEM workforce. Um, and so this project is probably the newest, and it's the one that um, I'm still thinking a lot about. Um, in general, my work is informed by a vast number of disciplines, which makes this a great place to be. Um, I draw heavily on sociology and organizational sociology. I draw heavily from critical organizational theories, so critical management studies. Um, and I also draw heavily from critical feminist thought and intersectionality. So I love to chat with any and all of you about this work. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Leslie. So we have Ruben Perra coming up next, and uh, Dr. Perra, do you have Perra Cardona, or you leave the Cardona on? Oh, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> okay, that really takes the stress out of it, right? Yeah. You can just call him everywhere. Yeah. Um, is an associate professor in human development and family studies, whose work looks at the cultural adaptation of evidence-based parenting interventions for Latino, Latina populations. Um, I have to apologize for just like quoting right off your websites, but I kind of had to grab those nuggets that you've already put in your own words so that I wouldn't screw it up. <laughs> but one of the things that I thought was a great connection between Dr. Perra's work and the Work-Life Office is this idea that things that we might take for granted in the way that we do, for instance, parenting should be maybe adapted or augmented to be more culturally appropriate. And so I'm thinking, well, we do orientation, which is maybe a whole lot unlike parenting. Um, <laughs> but the way we onboard people, the way we educate one another in the, in the academy, maybe we should be doing differently to be more appropriate for the cultural subgroups and language groups that we have on campus. And so I was hoping that you could help us make that connection across different cultural groups and making our practices more responsive. So, Dr. Perry. Do we get to share your news? Oh, yeah. So we're very lucky to have him with us today because after we set this up, it was um, he came to me and said, I'm not really sure I should participate in this because I won't be around to do any collaborative research because you have a new appointment in Texas at University of, University of Texas. And uh, so certainly your work in Latina parenting skills is going to be really, really needed there. However, we all know that the virtual world allows us to collaborate across the globe, never mind just down to Texas. So don't think you can get out of this. <laughs> Once a Spartan, always a Spartan, right? It's like, I mean, I'm already suffering for the Wisconsin game, so that I can tell you how, how green is my love right now. So thank you so much for this invitation, and I think that was a great connection. And also I was uh, talking with one of my uh, fellow uh, investigators, and, and she was telling, well, our, our, our longitudinal research on parenting demonstrates clearly the importance of uh, work-life parenting connection. Because in the first uh, major trial of the intervention we're adapting for immigrant populations, it was a randomized trial. And after the trial was completed in three months, uh, families were followed up for nine years. And they found a lot of outcomes that they were not expecting. Of course, it's like good adaptation of the children and the parents. But per capita income of the mothers who were randomized in the intervention that allowed them to learn effective parenting skill, skills quadruple four times increase compared to control group. And you know, when I think about when I get home after writing a grant, right? And then I have a little one who's looking at me and says, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And I'm like, uh, no, Daddy's not here. <laughs> right? Because I want to be looking at the TV, I want to disconnect, and, and that helped me to connect how important that is the parenting and the work-life balance are so interrelated. So, um, uh, our work is primarily with uh, Latino immigrant population. I've been doing this work for 15 years and just to acknowledge our sources of funding throughout this time and IMH, NIDA, and complementary funding from uh, MSU and Human Development and Family Studies. 
And I've been very, very privileged to work with the community in Detroit. And I, I love this picture because in the background, I, I think we see the challenges of the community. And we were talking about the challenges of the state of Michigan historically. But uh, my experience of the Detroit community is that very vibrant, very alive uh, painting because I have loved and continue to love my work with the community and, and I see it as a, as a lifetime commitment in, in terms of the resilience. You know, sometimes we get bogged down with the stress and all that and when you're working with parents who are working 12 to 14 hours, barely making it, and, and they get to our parenting sessions at night because we run our parenting groups from 8 to 9.30 because that's when parents can make it. They haven't eaten dinner, so we provide dinner and all that. And they say, we are, this is just a great day. I work a lot, I'm eating very good, and I'm learning how to relate to my kid. I mean, that, that's the spirit of the, of the immigrant spirit of the resilience, as well as with the people from Detroit who has allowed us uh, to run that program of research. So our work uh, has focused a lot on prevention because um, I did for many years uh, family therapy, I'm a family therapist by training, and family therapy with juvenile adjudicated to the justice system. And all the time, the issues went back to parenting. Uh, for that adolescent who was abusing substances or acting out, all the time we went back to, to parenting. The problem is, particularly for youth of color who enter the justice system, they say, once you enter the justice system, you're doomed. Right? Because of all the layers of disproportionate minority confinement. So that's when I made a decision when I graduated from my PhD to focus on prevention, to try to make a contribution to steer uh, children from, from, from that reality. So unfortunately, this is a, 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 an image that our parents experience on everyday life. I have experienced that as an immigrant myself, all the way to early 2000s when I got. I think it's just the intensity of that conversation, of, of those messages have increased, but have always been there. So th that's the very challenging reality of the parents we work with, parents who want to offer a contribution, offer a contribution, um, many times don't have many rights. Uh, but that's the, 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 the message they receive. On the other hand, uh, the other side of the coin is, uh, I love this picture because it says, La cultura cura, culture cures. And, and that was our premise. How is it that we can take all that adversity, but how is it that we can take culture and infuse it in the parenting work that we do to create a new reality for the parents we work with? So this is a, a randomized trial we, we run with uh, the NIMH support. And, um, Rather than reinventing the wheel, my work has been about how is it that we take existing efficacious painting intervention and disseminate it with ethnic minority populations by, through a process of cultural adaptation. So it's culturally relevant, it's culturally respectful, but also it's efficacious. It leads to parents changing their parenting behaviors. What you see here, it was a randomized trial with three groups. We had a basic adaptation in which we did good translation, good uh, cultural attunement of manuals, etc. Uh, and, and we focus exclusively on parenting themes. And then at second level of adaptation, we overtly address issues of uh, immigration challenges, we overtly address issues of discrimination, of racism, or how to come with ra racism and discrimination. So uh, these are our findings. It's a pre, uh, post test, and six month follow up. And what we can see here, the two cultural adapted interventions when we measure parenting skills really didn't differ between them but significantly different from the control group. So that means that parents in both groups benefited. But when we look at how much the children of those parents benefited from the interventions, uh, the, the children of those parents exposed to the parenting programs benefited, but the ones who uh, had the strongest benefits were the ones in which we overtly addressed contextual issues, discrimination, oppression. It was the enhanced intervention. So um, that goes along with this type of qualitative data that we gather to understand those slopes. For example, this mother said, uh, before the group, I was not close to my children. I would only yell at them, do this, do that. I learned here that one thing is respect and another fear. They were afraid of me. We never go to the parents and say, you're doing this wrong. It's like, this is the way you parent. Let me show you in another way. Try it. So all these insights, parents come with this by themselves after experiencing the skills we provide them. Learning how to discipline my kid has helped me because I can use my authority but without hurting him. Engaging fathers was very important for us because usually fathers are underrepresented. We were very happy we had a retention of about 
of others, but that was because we included construction workers as parent educators. So whenever we start with the first session, say, oh, I'm not coming for this, this is for women, and all that, and then the construction workers say, dude, I'm getting the group. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, let me come to the second session, and all that, so that, that was very, very important. Uh, the culture-specific sessions, when parents reflect about that, this is a, a major theme that parents talked about. I need to learn how to talk my, to my children about racism, because in many occasions, my children have suffered racism. racism just because they have Hispanic accent, they have experienced racism. And the biculturalism challenge, right? We're from here, we're from there. We need to teach our children to recognize opportunities they have here, like being bilingual. We also have to make sure that they adapt to our Latino culture. We need to help them to live between two cultures because by having two cultures, they will have many opportunities in life. And I really would like to close with that vision of resilience because um, it's just so inspiring when you have people so exposed to so much uh, adversity, but they embrace that resilience and how is it that I can contribute to a country that has offered me so much. Okay, thank you so much. That I love that picture of the, the mural and the optimism of the immigrants facing into Detroit. And maybe that's how we're going to help turn Detroit around. Um, so we have Dr. Cami Silk who's going to join us uh, now and I just want to mention, Cami, since I neglected to tell anyone else this, that because you're being recorded, you don't want to get too far over here by the window because you won't be in the camera range anymore. <laughs> but you stay there. You're in. You're in. No, we got you. And I just thought, oh, it really wasn't fair not to tell people that. So Cami is the Associate Dean of Research and the Director of the Masters of Health and Risk Communications and a professor appointment with Ag Bio Research. She's also, I need to say, a member of our newly formed Work-Life Office Advisory Committee. Yay! So, uh, Cami's interest is in particularly, uh, specifically developing effective health messages for the lay public that are sensitive to health literacy. So, of course, I saw a work-life connection there with effective messaging to our community about the importance of health-promoting work-life strategies and the importance of harmonizing work and personal lives. And a great deal of what the Work Life Office will be doing is around communicating and communication. So bringing people together about what resources are available, getting that information out, helping them access those to be as satisfied and productive as they can be. So I'm thinking Cami is going to help us do that. That's all right. You got your marks now. It's good. I'm ready to go. Um, so, um, I wear a lot of hats, but uh, the one hat I can't seem to ever take off is the research hat. So um, I work with a lot of students, uh, undergraduate students, master's students, go back this way and with the microphone, and I'll sing a little song for you too. <laughs> I hope you got that on record. No, um, but um, we uh, work in research teams in, in my department, in my college, so we, um, every, at least in my department, everybody has a number of students that they work with, and so uh, because of that team uh, approach, we we're able to kind of accomplish quite a bit, and so I want to share um, kind of my um, major research question, um, where I do have sort of a, a very programmatic line of research around communicating uh, breast cancer and the environment to lay audiences. I also am very project driven, and so I have a lot of topics because I study communication, so lots of health issues um, I've dealt with over the years. So what I study, so my central questions are really around persuasion. I was trained in persuasion and social influence. So how do you get people to think and do what you want them to do? Um, and this has sort of a very social site kind of approach too, I'm sure. Uh, people can see those connections here too. Um, but how do we influence individuals to engage in recommended health practices? And what types of messages are most impactful in influencing knowledge, attitudes, norms, efficacy, intentions, and ultimately behavior? It's always a hard one to really get at. We measure lots of things, but how do we really capture behavior sometimes? Do we do it well? Um, so I, um, I'll say that I think that there's big connections to the work-life office in that um, with the campaign focus of things that I do um, on the formative research side of things, sort of the implementation science side of things, and the evaluation of effects and effectiveness, I think that there's real connections to maybe anybody in the room who wants to do an intervention kind of thing and wants to really focus on um, how do we build evidence-based messages that are uh, uh, sensitive to culture, sensitive to health literacy issues, those types of things. So um, my primary major uh, area of research is try to give you a sense of the types of projects that we do to give you um, a range of the sort of the scope of what we can do. 
is um, the Breast Cancer and Environment Research Program, where we work with biologists and epidemiologists um, on human and animal studies, but we do the translation of science to the lay public. And so um, I've actually just uh, gotten two other NCI and NIHA grants to sort of study that process a bit more, and also to train physicians around uh, communicating um, to uh, environmental vectors to uh, caregivers, so parents of kids. And then I've worked with nursing quite a bit. So I have a strong history of interdisciplinary research. Like pretty much everything we do is partnered. Um, so nursing, um, Millie Hordinsky, who sadly is retired, I've worked with her on infant feeding for a number of years. Um, we've partnered a lot with campus, which is why I think work life is sort of the next natural step to, to partner with, with uh, RHS and Student Health uh, Services, MSU Counseling Center, on different campus health campaigns. If any of you have seen squirrels in bathrooms, that's my group. <laughs> we do that uh, for health messages. Um, back in the day, we worked with the MSU, MSU Counseling Center with um, Jan Collins Eglin, who was in charge. She had a, a SAMHSA grant, and uh, we did some interesting things where they actually changed their intake form to see what neighborhood people came from, because we had an intervention neighborhood and a non-intervention neighborhood, and we actually saw a small uptick in people using services in the intervention neighborhood. And that's the kind of good working relationship where people are willing to do that, but you can really show some, some evidence of effects. Uh, currently, we're working with Sparrow to do uh, speaking up about medical errors and near misses. So we're doing, um, hopefully, going to help improve that with the CFIR grant that we have. And then I've been working through the Healthy Campus Initiative on a bike collaborative uh, collaboration, which is uh, probably my leadership hope is going to end this year. But lots of partners around the table from many offices to help improve bike safety on campus. Um, and so we've been working with trying to help get it designated as a platinum bike. Um, university and, and lots of other campaign activities, chalking. And so we do a lot of different things. The thing that I do believe that might have the biggest relevance to many people in the room is this diffusion idea. That um, it's not, I don't know that I'm a diffusion of innovations researcher, certainly Jim Deering, the chair of my department is, um, but I do believe that this is this kind of framework could help any endeavor uh, that uh, anybody wants to engage in, because what we're trying to do is get to get people to adopt new practices, and how do you do that?